Babies are selfish. Did you know that? <laughs> babies are selfish and they're demanding, but they're also super cute. Uh, we got a couple little babies here in the front and you look at them and you think, how in the world would they be selfish? But babies are super selfish. It's their job. I have a granddaughter, Emily Lorraine, and she's the most selfish little creature in the entire world because she's supposed to be. She's one. And when she's hungry, she is demanding. As a matter of fact, when she's hungry, she says, eat, 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 eat. And she keeps saying it and she'll bang on stuff until you feed her. And if for some reason, even though it's selfish, it's super cute. She is um, demandingly, selfishly super cute. When you're a baby, it's okay. When you get a teenager, a 15 year old who's hungry and they start banging the table yelling, eat, 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 eat. It's not so cute. And although selfish, not okay. You get a full grown adult who bangs the table and says, eat, 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 where's my dinner? Um, that's dysfunctional. And if you do that, don't do that, right? Because as an adult, as a person who has grown through the stages of life, we realize that it's not okay to be selfish. It's not okay to be demanding. It's, life's not about us. It's not about me. That I have to live an outward focused life, but it's counter to the way that I was created. And in our walk with Jesus, we have to be outwardly focused in our faith. We can't be demanding. We can't be selfish because we can't stay spiritual babies. Today, we're gonna to be talking about a passage of scripture that you've already become familiar with. And there's a supporting passage of scripture that you and I've talked about before. We're gonna be back for the second week uh, in an eight week series on the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 people. Now it wasn't just 5,000 people, it was 5,000 men. And there were probably another 15,000 people there. So the feeding of the 20,000. If you don't remember the miracle, it goes something like this. Um, Jesus just found out that his best friend or one of his best friends, John the Baptist had been beheaded and um, he was grieving and needed to take a little time alone. We talked about that last week and how important it is for rest and for time alone. Now, Jesus, as he moved across the lake to take some time alone was um, followed by crowds who always seemed to be following Jesus. Now the disciples were with Jesus and had been for some time at this point, And they were trying to figure out what their role was in all of this. And so you have two distinct groups of people. You have a crowd that's coming toward Jesus and you have a group of disciples that are seated back here, maybe behind Jesus. They'd been busy all day with Jesus teaching and doing different things. And they're watching Jesus to find out what they have to do or what they should do with the crowd. Now, Jesus looked around at the administrator, at the executive, the, the accountant, the person who kept track of the books in his band of disciples. And he said, how are we gonna feed this crowd? And first of all, they didn't know that they were gonna feed the crowd. And secondly, they didn't know how. And so this administrator, this bookkeeper, this accountant said, we don't have the resources it would take, you know, blah, 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 all this stuff, just all this details, all this, we can't, it's impossible. And so Jesus, you know, although he was testing him, well, I guess maybe he failed the test. Another one of the disciples, a little more trusting, hard to know what was in his head, was looking around frantically and found a little boy in the front row with some crackers and some fish. And he said, hey, I got this, Jesus, what can you do with this? And the Bible says, Jesus took the crackers and took the fish that he looked to heaven and he gave thanks. He broke it, he handed it to the disciples. They passed it out to the crowd of 20,000 some odd people and every single person was fed, was full. And there were 12 baskets left over that they, the disciples were able to carry off. Amazing miracle. It is talked about in all four gospels. So it's very important for us to study. And we're taking eight weeks to study it. Now I wanna talk today about the difference between being a consumer, like we are born into being, a selfish, life is all about me type of a person um, into a contributor, somebody who realizes that my job here on earth is to contribute to others and to serve. Now, it's not just a life stage or life cycle thing. Spiritually, we follow the exact same pattern. When we become believers, oftentimes we're very consumer oriented. It's all about us. But as we learn to have uncommon faith, we become more outward focused and ultimately end up realizing that it's our job to be contributors, but that's why Jesus put us here on earth. And so I wanna to talk today about a passage that supports this idea. We find it in the book of Philippians where the apostle Paul is talking about how important it is to live like Jesus and to serve like Jesus, because after all the disciples were literally able to look at Jesus and say, what do we do next? And the apostle Paul says, I understand you can't look at Jesus because he's no longer here. He's ascended into heaven. And although the Holy Spirit indwells us and lives within us, we have to have instructions. And so the apostle Paul writes some instructions to a church that's just getting started, one that he founded and one that he loved. 
but it's a bunch of brand new Christians who've been indoctrinated by other religions and other types of faith. And so he's writing on how we get along with each other and he's writing about how we get along in the world. And I wanna read it to you and we're gonna break it down and then we're gonna come back to this miracle and we're gonna talk about the disciples and some things that they learned that illustrate this important point as the apostle Paul points us back toward Jesus. The apostle Paul tells us, and he told the church at Philippi, don't be selfish. Quit living your life trying to win and achieve and bite and scratch and scrape and compete and put your foot on the neck of other people so that you can arrive at the level that you want to arrive at. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Acknowledge the fact that it's not about you, that it's not really about us at all. To quit worry of impression management and what other people think. We don't have to think about or be concerned with keeping up with the neighbors or people who are in our life. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. Now, I promise you, the people who were hearing this letter, they were scratching their heads and they said, I don't know if this is possible. I can look out for my own interests. And sometimes I do a pretty good job of looking out for my own people's interests. But you want me to literally stop worrying about elevating myself and winning? And you want me to think about the other people who are around me? So they scratch their head like you and I do and go, okay, I need to hear a little more because this sounds pretty tough. Certainly not the way we were born naturally and certainly not the way we were born again. But anyone who stays in the same stage of development as we were selfish and demanding, like a baby spiritually or otherwise, something's desperately wrong. And so then the apostle Paul turns us toward Jesus, which he often does. And he says, in your relationship with one another, this is how we relate, have the same mindset as Christ, think the same thoughts, learn to process and view the world the same way. That's the most churchy thing a person could ever say, right? Well, you just gotta be like Jesus. And like, I can't be like Jesus. Jesus was perfect. He was sinless. Jesus was God. I can't be like Jesus. And the apostle Paul is suggesting it not only because it's possible, but because it's promised in us. We're not gonna become Jesus. We can learn to react, to adopt the same perspective or worldview, to care about the same things Jesus cares about. And it means a step away from the old natural selfish and demanding self and a step into a whole new way of life. And he says, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus, who being God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. There is a legend, a story about Greek gods, two in particular. And in Roman and Greek culture, humility and servanthood were not virtues. A person who established position and demanded respect either by position or power had risen to the highest level of society and the gods, their gods, their false gods, well, they emulated this. But there's a story, folklore, that Zeus and one of his buddies, another god, put on cloaks of servants because they had to cover up their chiseled physique, their long flowing hair, their piercing eyes, their tall stature, and all of the godlike qualities that were attributed to, to these so-called deities. But they put on the cloak of a servant and they went down and they mingled amongst the common people, well, you and me, because they wanted to find out who was worshiping them and who wasn't. And so they wandered around looking like servants, really having all of their splendor hidden underneath. And at the appropriate time, after they'd taken enough notes and written enough things down and decided who was for them and who was against them and who deserved to be you know, rewarded and who deserved to be punished, they went to the most public place and threw off their cloaks and said, it is us, the gods. We have surprised you because we look like servants, but we're really not. So the people who were hearing this for the first time, it was blowing their minds a little bit because what this means is that Jesus, when we look at this word being, let's move to the next slide that he was not disguising who God is. 
when he came to earth. He wasn't putting on a mask and trying to act like something that he wasn't. Jesus was revealing who God is. And you say, well, how could God be a servant? God's a servant, but he's not subservient. And you look at the story of God's interaction or relation to us, to humans. He created us for his glory and for us to have a relationship with him. Now, why do you think he did that? Because it serves us in our best interest to know God and to know him completely. And nothing else serves us more. He offered us the ability to have a relationship with him where we can exist in a state that you and I, if we are followers of Christ, will one day know, but right now, all we can do is imagine. And then you look at the story of God's interaction with humankind and you see Adam and Eve born into a garden, created into a garden, excuse me, that was perfect. Their nature, they hadn't yet sinned making a huge mistake that changed everything. And because God was holy and because he was perfectly just, he had to curse humankind, but because he was loving and merciful and had a servant nature about him, he put a plan in place to restore the gap, the broken relationship between us and him that was only revealed later by God serving us by giving Jesus Christ his only son. And man, it cost him to come and live a life here on earth for 33 years where he was misunderstood, where he was rejected many times, where he was talked badly about. People called him crazy. They called him son of Satan. They said his motives were wrong. They said he wasn't who he, who he claimed to be. And ultimately being put to death on a cross after being tortured. And then of course, we know the rest of the story. He rose again, defeating sin, Satan and death once and for all, providing the way for us to have a relationship with God if that's not service, friends, I don't know what is. And all the time, God did for us what we could never do for ourselves. And Jesus did for us, even though we could never do anything in return to repay or deserve. So the apostle Paul is saying in all of your relationships with each other, think the same thoughts that Jesus thought, live the same way that Jesus lived, who even though he is God, revealed the character of God by coming to earth and living among ordinary people. And in this moment in time, on this unlikely hillside, with this unusual band of followers, the disciples, and a crusty crowd of people who've already shown that their motives weren't always pure, were converging. So the disciples look to Jesus. The crowd looks to Jesus. Jesus looks to God the Father. And he gave us an object lesson that we're gonna talk about in just a few minutes as we apply these things to our life. We're gonna sing a couple songs and then we're gonna come back and we're gonna talk about this. And I don't know what you need to hear today. I have no idea, but I've prayed all week that you would hear exactly what it is you need to hear today. And I am not wise enough or a good enough preacher or intuitive enough to figure out the exact thing that you need to hear this morning. I can pray, which I have. I can prepare, which I promise you I've done. I can plan, I can organize, I can think the best way I can possibly communicate this to you. But only God himself can take the truth you need to hear today. And it may just be one thing, something you need to do, maybe to stop doing, maybe an encouragement, maybe a forgiveness you need to offer, maybe something of forgiveness you need to ask for. Who knows what it might be, but there's one thing he might do this morning and only you will know that if your heart's opened and you're willing to listen. So don't waste these next few minutes as we sing use these next minutes as time to ask God, what is it you might be talking to me about? Because I don't want you to leave this place in a few minutes without getting that one thing. If you're not careful, your life could be different in the best possible way. So we are one weekend to 10 for 10. And um, 
we said, 10 for 10, are you in? And I guess we can say nine for nine now, are you fine? Because we have nine left. Uh, we've had all kinds of rhymes among the church staff and none of them are great, but hey, we have fun with it. Um, are you in 10 for 10? We have chosen to do an experiment, a little workshop, a, um, a project where we make sure that we get ourselves in a place where God can show us the blessing that we receive from giving to the things that he cares about. And we believe at Capital City Church that it's super important to do that. I think that it's a biblical principle and I have seen it played out in my life many, many times that it's absolutely impossible to outgive God. So what we're doing during this next 10 weeks is if you have never, ever given to the church, if you've never given to anything that, that God uh, cares about to your knowledge and you wanna start just to see what this is all about, we've made it super easy by all of us agreeing to give $10 for 10 weeks. Now, if you've already been giving maybe sporadically, I would ask that you give $10 more because it's good to stretch ourselves a little bit. It's just 10 bucks after all. And if you give faithfully to the church, as so many of you do to the Lord through the church, uh, $10 more for 10 weeks. And this is what happens. We are illustrating the principle found in the miracle that we're talking about, which is God can do a lot with a little. Now, some of us may think we give a lot and we give sacrificially, but in the grand scheme of things to the Lord, it's still a little. And this little boy who emptied his lunchbox and gave it to Jesus, I mean, was part of a miracle that was far greater than he could ever imagine. And that's what I want for you guys. I've asked Jared to come up here again. Uh, he's gonna give you uh, an easy way to give 10 for 10 through our app, or excuse me, through the texting to give, but we do have other ways to do this. If you carry cash, which my wife carries cash and gives it to me on a selective basis, um, you can actually take cash and put it in the box on your way out, $10. Uh, if you write checks, my boy, you don't write checks, do you? Checks, no, no I'm uh, 39 and I've written maybe four or five checks in my yeah. life. And so we still, so I can't figure it out. fine for old people. Yeah, I have a, <laughs> that's, I have, that's not what I'm saying, I'm not saying somewhere. that. But. Yeah, we will I'll totally ignore that you called me old. Yeah, no, um, that's not Also, uh, we have an easy link through our website. We have a, on our app a link through different giving uh, methods. But the easiest way is uh, to text to give. I'll tell you, last week I told you um, part about my motive uh, here. And I, I hope you guys, you trust me by now. We've been together, many of us, for six years. And you know I love you and I don't want anything from you. I want something for you. And I told you this is a principle that I, that I teach my own, my own boys who go to a different church in a different state. And this week I had a great opportunity that I think was a divine appointment. I don't even think you know this. It's about Nathan, where God just set it up on a tee and um, Nathan is uh, 24 and he's sort of moving along in life and, and uh, he, he took on some responsible debt, something that was necessary. He worked through it for six weeks. I mean, did it the right way. I was super proud of him and it was excruciating to walk through the process because I was more concerned than he was, I think. And, and after he took on this, this debt, it was a good debt. Um, he looked at me, or not didn't look at me, but we were talking on the phone. I assume he was looking at the phone. He said, dad, I'm freaked out. And I said, well, you're supposed to be freaked out. You're growing up, you're becoming an adult and being an adult is expensive. Yeah. And he said, I'm going to need some help. And I said, well, mom and I aren't paying for this. And he goes, that's not what I mean. He said, can you help me with a budget? And he said, I've never really had to, I mean, I kind of budget, but I've never really had to really budget before. Be careful because he's made more than he needed. And what do you think the first thing on my mind was when Joy and I want to help him with a budget? I want him to give to the Lord in a priority, which means that it's before anything else because you and I both know that when we give sacrificially to the Lord and we wait till the end of the month, the money can be gone and we miss the blessing. I want it to be a percentage that he's comfortable with. It hurts a little bit because that requires faith. And I also want it to be progressive for him. I want it to grow. And so as long as he's gonna let me in, encourage him in this way, that's what I want. And it's not because it's gonna make a huge difference to the church he goes to. And it certainly won't make a difference to our church. I know what God's gonna do in his life when he develops this kind of discipline and this kind of pattern. And I want that for you more than anything else. There's freedom that comes when we learn to let go. So tell us how to do this. Yeah, so this is a, uh, like I said, a great option. Um, one of the things I had somebody come up after first service and they said, hey, I, I have my recurring giving set up. Um, if I do this, that just is the $10 more that goes on top of that. And I said, yeah, and they said, okay, good, because I forgot my password and I don't know how to go in and change that to up the $10. And so they stepped into the text to give. And again, it's a great option for that. It's super simple. Um, if you're watching online, 
line right now, there's going to be a lower third that's actually explaining all the different ways you can use this phone number and give is actually one of those. But so what we're going to do is we're going to start out by texting the word give to our phone number here, 515-517-8842. And when you do that, you'll receive a link back that asks you to opt in to texting. So this is just to keep us in compliance with our app developer. And uh, again, just make sure that you guys want to communicate with the church. Uh, we're not selling your information. This isn't you opting in for calls about a car warranty. Uh, car warranty. Yeah, we don't like car that. warranties. Yeah. No. Um, we're not going to check and see if you have a timeshare you'd like to sell. None of that okay. kind of stuff. We're not going to do any of that. This is, again, just an opt-in so you can receive these text messages back and forth with From us. From us, yes. And so uh, once you do that, you'll be able to text your number, the number you want to give, um, which would be, again, for 10 for 10. It's that $10. So you'd send that text. Once you send the $10 text, you would, you'll receive back a link for setting up your donor account. And if you did all of this last week, all you need to do is give 10, and it gets processed with the information that you included last week. If you're doing it for the first time, that link, you'll go follow that and set up your donor account. That's your name, your email address, uh, your desired payment source, and you'll hit OK on that. And once you do, you'll receive that receipt. Again, same thing. If you've set that up last week, give 10 this week is what you type to our phone number. And once you've done that, you'll receive the receipt and a link. Again, the church uh, uses the donor account to maintain all of this, and so at the end of the year, we can send you guys a donation, a contribution receipt for all of those transactions. Super easy. Yes, super and, easy. And then from then on, all you have to do is one text message and then one amount for the next yes. next nine yep. weeks. You're in good shape. So yeah, absolutely, it does make it easy. I even figured it out last week, and I sometimes I'm like, I'm like the test uh, monkey. And if Jared can get me to do it successfully, then he knows everybody else can probably do it successfully. So you guys can certainly do it. Thank you. You, you very said much that, for, not me. I know I said that. You did call me old, though. So, so back to our story here as we begin to wrap this up. The Apostle Paul had instructed the church that he loved and that he started that for us to get it right with each other and the world around us, we have to adopt the same attitude that Jesus adopted, the same perspective. And he called himself Jesus a servant. But we have to see what that looks like. And so you have the disciples here on the hillside, and they're seated. And they're looking at Jesus and they're saying, all right, what's this look like? Because after all, we want to figure it out. We want to be like you. And you have the crowd coming up. Now, the disciples looked at the crowd and this is what they heard. Eat, 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 eat. Now, and in a baby, it's super cute. But in a crowd, not so much. And here they come. Now, Matthew 9 gives us some insight into Jesus when he looked at a crowd. A different crowd on a different day. The Bible says Jesus looked at the crowd coming and he saw them as harassed and helpless, not knowing any better than just to ask for food and for whatever healing or miracle they may find. Like sheep without a shepherd and that he was moved in his gut his splatna, physically moved with compassion. So the disciples, they looked at Jesus and Jesus says, all right, we're gonna feed you. And I think there are at least two things that the disciples learned this day. There are a whole lot more things, a whole lot more. As they're moving from their spiritual babyhood to their spiritual adulthood. I think the first thing that they learned is that oftentimes, that Jesus was generous when he was interrupted. That servanthood or our responsibility to other people has very little to do with our own agenda or our own schedule because almost always throughout scripture, you see Jesus when he did the most amazing miracles, they happened in the most unlikely times. And I would think that in your own life, you may have that same experience. That sometimes big M miracles and little M miracles happen at times when you would never have expected it. And we get so preoccupied with our own to-do list and trust me, the disciples had one. Jesus was tired, the disciples were tired. They were peopled out. They had a busy schedule. They needed some time with Jesus to be able to ask some questions. At the end of a long day, one of the most inconvenient times to have to be involved or engaged with somebody else 
couldn't I just have some me time? So they looked at Jesus to see if he was going to turn the crowds away. And instead, he did one of the most amazing miracles that we read about in, in all of scripture. He was generous when interrupted. The Russian church many years ago had a certain people called the Pustaniki. And they would devote themselves, this group within the church, to a life of prayer. They would withdraw to the desert from time to time. And they would live in solitude, but not in isolation. They knew that being by themselves some of the time was really good, but they had a saying and they said that as we live our lives, we have to live our lives with the latch off the door. We have to be available. Now, this begs all sorts of questions. Uh, one of them is how available? Because we serve many people in our lives. We can't just simply be distracted, tossed from one thing to the next every time somebody wants something. And so what Jesus, I think, was teaching the disciples is two very important questions, qualifying thoughts or statements. The first one, and you'll see this next week, is the question, can I help you? Now, that's a great way for us to relate to the world around us. Can I help you? But the answer is almost always yes, if we're willing. And the next question that I think Jesus illustrated was, should I help you. And one of the things that fascinates me in scripture are all the times Jesus chose not to do miracles, all the people he chose not to feed, all of the people he walked past with a smile, but chose not to heal. And we read about the ones that he chose to heal and the miracles that he did, but there were a lot of times when he didn't. So, Jesus was generous when he was interrupted. The second thing that we see is that Jesus was generous when he dealt with difficult people. Many of us have difficult people in our lives and we have to choose to be for people and not against them. That we have to free the people from the mental prisons that we put them in. And the disciples had pretty well categorized the crowd as a bunch of takers, as a bunch of consumers and not contributors seemed like they always wanted something from Jesus. Heal our sick, do the miracles, do your tricks, tell us your stories. But what Jesus wanted to show them is that when every crowd came, even though their motives were probably not always pure, and even though some of them were the very ones to contribute to Jesus' arrest and crucifixion, that when every crowd left, that there was a remnant that stayed behind. And the remnant that stayed behind to talk to Jesus, to figure out what it was really about, to see these things as signs and not just miracles, they became followers of Jesus in the most genuine way. And Jesus was saying, you cannot allow your preconceived notions of people the mental prisons that you put somebody else in by judging and labeling them, trying to discern motives and to discern intention to give you an excuse not to engage. Now, Jesus looked to God the Father for what he should do. The disciples, they looked to Jesus for what they should do. And they were just figuring it out. At this point, spiritual teenagers. Sometimes the disciples, and we see this, were banging on the table feed us Jesus. And he's like, it's more than food, fellas. But at the end of the time they were with Jesus, when Jesus was ready to ascend into heaven, he gave them a charge or a challenge. And he said, and this is my paraphrase, I'm getting ready to go and I'm coming back and I'm going to leave with you someone who's just like me, but better because he's not limited to proximity. He's within you. The Holy Spirit of God, when you become a Christian, you're indwelled with the Holy Spirit who's going to answer these questions. Can you help someone? Should you help someone? All we have to do is be willing to shift our perspective and view ourselves the same way Jesus did as a contributor, not a consumer. Life is not about me. And so the disciples and you and I learned that this works itself out in concentric circles because we all have difficult people in our lives and we all have an agenda and we all have schedules and they're important. I mean, we serve many people, but it starts for a Christian with the people who are closest to us. 
And I am not one bit or for one second trying to judge you or make you feel bad if you have blown this in the past. We're all about what starts today and what continues tomorrow. But if you're married, we serve our spouse, even if our spouse doesn't serve us back. Because we've chosen to serve Jesus and that's the reason we serve our spouse because that's the way we show that we love Jesus and that's the way that we show that we love our spouse. Now, I'm not judging things have happened and things happen. I'm talking about today and as we move forward. But the principle of service is, I will serve you even if I'm not happy a day in my life because it's not your responsibility to make me happy. It's my responsibility to honor God in my relationship with you if the spouse has that same attitude, then you develop an amazing marriage. But you're not responsible for what they do. You're only responsible for what you choose to do. And you gotta go first. I cannot tell you how many people I've talked to about this principle. And I'm like, yep, if my wife would just start acting this way, I'd be right along behind her. I'd start serving her right back. And I'm going, dude, be a leader. Serve the Lord by serving your wife. The brave person has to go first. The next concentric circle for many of us, not all of us, would be kids. And for those of you who don't have kids, give me a second to talk about this because you were a kid at some point and you'll appreciate it. It's our job as parents to serve our children, which means that we create an environment in and around their lives where they can become little men and women of God, which means we give them enough margin in their life to be able to breathe and to respond, that we put them in the right kinds of places that allow them to become followers of Jesus and and try to structure away from the wrong kind of places to make best choices for them as a parent to take responsibility for their emotional and their physical and their spiritual well-being because your kids weren't put on earth to serve you that happens later as they learn to follow Christ but you my friend we were put on earth to serve them God trusted us with them which sometimes means making hard choices. Sometimes it means saying no. Sometimes it means letting them hate our guts because we serve the Lord by serving them. Now, we got one more concentric circle. For some of you, it's your best friends, your closest friends. For some of you, it's the people you work with or you work around. We as followers of Christ, we represent Christ in, in, in the workplace. Some of us, we serve a boss. Sometimes we are the boss and we serve those who work for us. We serve the people who are around us. And the principle is this, that everybody that we are around, whether it's up, whether it's down, whether it's side to side or better off, for us, it's in their faith. When our time with them is over than they were when we met them. That we're not taking from them, even if they work for us, that we're giving to them and building them up, nudging and encouraging them to become a follower of Christ. But you can't just expect them to get what you say. You gotta actually let them see what you do. And you can be an amazing boss and really and truly exhibit servant leadership to the people who look up to you. Well, it works itself out into another concentric circle and that could be the church. I have a dream. I know that Martin Luther King said that, but I can have a dream too. What if everyone showed up on Sunday morning to Capital City Church, having been praying in the car, got their worship on, as soon as you walk in the doors, you are looking for opportunities to serve the people around you. Not for one second expecting someone to serve me but seeing myself as a contributor, not a consumer. Now it's okay, not everybody starts that way, but that's the way we're supposed to end up. 
where we don't worry about how the coffee tastes or what the temperature of the worship center is or whether I like the music or whether it's too loud or too soft or whether the chairs are comfortable or whether the preacher's good or bad. Whether I, I mean, I come in and I say, today I'm gonna to adopt the mindset of Jesus. And I am going to love and serve the people who God has put in my path. Whether that means holding a door, whether it means a smile, whether it means a handshake, whether it means a follow-up, because I'm looking toward the Holy Spirit to tell me, can I help you and should I help you? How amazing would it be? What would people see as they look in? But for years and years and years, we, not this church and you and me, but church in general, we've tolerated a, an inward focused, selfish sort of an approach that turns us into consumers and not contributors. Now, there's a point that goes further than this. And we're almost done. So pay attention just for one more minute, if you will. The reason that you and I, at the moment in time we become Christians, we're not immediately whisked away to heaven. You follow that? It's like, all right, I'm going to give my life to Christ. So here I am. Trust you, Jesus, for who you are. I believe in you. I confess my sin. I know you died for my sins. I believe you rose again. I want to follow you and follow you with my life. You can have all of me. I want to be a Christian. Why do you think that at that point you aren't magically, spiritually, immediately transferred to heaven? Boom, game over. Because that's what would make sense to me if we didn't have a mission here. But since we have a mission here, all of these things that we do are for a purpose and for a point, which goes to this next and last concentric circle, which is the community and the world around us. Because God didn't leave us here to be a holy huddle, just learning more and discussing and, and supporting each other and talking about how holy we are without doing anything with our faith because that doesn't make us spiritual, that just makes us weird. And for too many years, people have thought we're too weird. Now, sometimes the weirdness is earned because we live a little different than some people. But sometimes the weirdness, man, it's our fault. And this is the temptation of a church in general. It's to form a holy huddle, to find some place that gives me everything I want every Sunday. If not, I'm gonna go down the street, right? Everyone makes me happy. The music makes me tap my foot. The pastor's funny. We get into a holy huddle. I share my burden sometimes. Don't ever want to be too authentic because after all, you don't know who you can trust. And I come to try to get the strength that I need to make it through my week so that I cannot do anything with my faith all week long except exist and then come right back around to get the strength that I need to go one more week. And we're missing the point because that wasn't the attitude of Jesus. And so for, for years, sometimes the temptation is to hide behind the walls of the church, calling it Christian community. And we took the gospel and we said we're evangelistic, but all we did was throw the gospel over the wall of the church and hope it splattered on somebody on the other side. And we called it sharing our faith. And it's not sharing our faith. We can't catapult our faith over the walls of the church and hope it hits our target. And the worst part is, is that sometimes when we hope it hits them, we hope it hurts. Now, our job is to adopt the same attitude or mindset as Jesus. And after we've been here celebrating who Jesus is, worshiping and serving each other, growing in our faith and learning how it is we should live, then we walk around or out of the walls of the church and we go out to the point, to the reason we're still here, left behind, right? Waiting for Jesus to come again. Which is how do I live my faith from Monday through Saturday? And how do I show the world around me that Jesus is real even though there are holes in my life and flaws? That the crowd isn't a distraction. That the crowd is the point. And perhaps it's time for us to stop being angry at them, labeling them, lobbying against them, picketing them and judging them. And perhaps it's time for us to start loving them. Because loving and serving our world is the only way people will find a saving relationship with Jesus. And I didn't say it's easy, but it's right. I was talking to two of our church family, just uh, in between services. And I said, I'm preaching to you guys or about you guys today. Their names are Connie and Dixie. I said, I'm preaching about you. 
And they said, oh, you know, they kind of laughed and they were humble. And I said, you guys, you model what I'm talking about today. You're some of the most selfless servants to your church, to your family, and to the world around you that I had probably ever seen. And you've done it consistently in the six years that I've known you. And they said, Rick, the thing that people don't know is that that's the only way to truly be happy. They said, before we decided to live this way, we didn't know, but we decided to take the risk. And they begin to view their lives a different way. And they said, we have never been happier. Seems counterintuitive. But that doesn't mean it's not right. So you and I, together on Sunday mornings and each Wednesday night or Monday night or Sunday, whenever you're in a city group, we practice this stuff because we're not good at it. And we talk about this stuff because we need to learn more. And then we go do this stuff because by God's grace, by some miracle, he allows the gospel to be seen through broken lives like mine and like yours. That's what we're about at Capital City Church. That's where we're going to keep going together. And I can't wait for the next six weeks of this series because as we break it down piece by piece, you'll see how it builds a puzzle, a perfect puzzle of a generous life and of an uncommon faith. Father, as we conclude our time together, I pray.